Let us pray. Father, reveal to us an abundance of knowledge related to the third person of the Trinity, how he blessed and helped even in the creation of the earth, how he was grieved by those that uh, sinned against you before the flood. And help us to, to understand him in a more remarkable and amazing manner uh, than ever before. And we resist the devil that would keep us from learning the truths of God. And we ask, Lord, that you will just open up our total insides to this, that we shall truly and surely be wonderfully blessed. And all the people said, Amen. The Holy Spirit does make demands upon our lives. We often preach and teach the demands that God, who is our Heavenly Father, makes upon human persons. And uh, we, the beginning, the very beginning of humanity, really, uh, God planted a garden, and uh, he put Adam and Eve in that garden, and he said, uh, there are 999 trees here, but there's one there you don't touch. That was a demand. Don't touch that tree. Well, they, they, they didn't accept the demand of God. And you say, well, why didn't they accept it? Very simply, because if God had made them automatums to where they would be a piece of machinery, then they would not have the ability to love. And if you have always had a hard time wondering why Adam sinned and why Hitler did what he did in Europe, it's for the simple reason that, that God made us creatures of volitional powers and that we can decide. Now, if he hadn't done that, he, you couldn't love him because you cannot, you cannot make love uh, love. You have to permit love to love. If you don't love because you want to, then it's something else. It's not love. If you shake your fist in your wife's face and say, you're going to love me, well, honey, you just lost it all. She might kick you on the shins or something like that, but that's about the, the best you're going to get. Well, the, it's the same with God. God can't roll up his fist and say, you love me. Or you wouldn't love him at all. It's a decision you have to make. Now, if God had not have made us that way, he wouldn't have had the creatures that could love him. Now, now, now most of you have children. You didn't have to have children. They make big, beautiful dolls. You could have bought your, uh, uh, a doll that looked like a boy and sat it in one corner, and a doll like a girl sat in another corner, and say, now, now, Mary and John, you sit there. And you know, they would have done it. Yeah. But they wouldn't kiss you goodnight. Never, you see. So God had to decide whether he wanted mummies in the corner or some folks like you. Are you here? It's a big decision. And, and so you, you do not have to obey God. Of course, if you break you know, the, the laws of the Lord and you break the fabric that holds the universe together, you'll suffer for it. Have to, you know. Uh, you, if you take the law of gravitation and say, I don't believe in you, and you go jump off of a house, you know, a few seconds later you say, say, I believe now. <laughs> and some of us have to do things like that before we get to believing, Amen. you see. But God is not going to make you do anything. And the devil cannot make you do anything. So all that you do, you do it willfully. Willfully. By your own will. But we often preach and teach that God makes demands upon our lives. He has from the time of Adam and Eve. We also declare, in point B, the demands of the Lord Jesus Christ upon those who will be his disciples. It was hard. He looked them straight in the face and put that long bony finger out and said, if you would be my disciples, and if you wish to follow me, three things, deny yourself. They all shrunk four foot right there. Sure they did. Deny yourself. Then he said, take up your cross. Who? That wasn't his cross, it was their cross. And then he said, follow me. And no doubt he made a footprint there. Says, Walk in those steps. You see, well, those are what we call demands. The demands of the Lord Jesus Christ upon those who would be his disciples. Now, your point C is, we may not hear so much from pulpits preached 
regarding the authority of the third person of the Trinity to make demands upon believers. Are you here? Yeah. I don't suppose you ever heard a sermon where he said, I'm going to preach to you now about the demands of the Holy Ghost upon your life. Ooh. So we may not hear much regarding the authority of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to make, to make demands upon believers, but as we seek after the Spirit, we will know perfectly the mind of the Spirit. The mind of the Spirit. In Romans 8 and 5 it says, For they that are after the, the flesh, those that are carnally minded and those who live after the world and those that live to satisfy their natural person, they mind the things of the flesh. But they that are going to live after the Spirit, with a capital S, the person of the Spirit, they are going to mind the things of the Spirit. That means he's going to make demands upon their lives. That if they are going to leave live, living carnally and naturally and sinfully, and if they're going to walk in the Holy Spirit of God, then there are certain things they're going to have to do in order to have fellowship with the Spirit of God. You cannot have fellowship with the Spirit of God unless you're willing to say, I will obey the things that He wants me to do and the things that He wants me to be. In Romans 8 and verse 27, it says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And now, you know, a, a scripture like that is such an amazing word from God that he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. That Spirit, Holy Spirit, he maketh intercession. Now, now, now Jesus is an intercessor. When you do something wrong, he says, Father, forgive but it says the Holy Spirit also makes intercession for the saints but he makes intercession on a condition it's related to the will of God in your life now if you don't take it all you might miss it all which wouldn't be good if you don't realize that he's making intercession we are the saints that he is doing it according to what God's will is for you and so you might be asking him to do one thing and he'll be doing another because whatever he makes intercession for is according to God's will in our lives the Holy Spirit in making his demands uh, upon the, the body of Christ warns them you might say demands them not to be involved in demon worship that's in 1 Timothy 4 and 1 that you have before you. There's your next verse. It says, the Spirit, with a capital S, the person of the Spirit, that he speaketh, say speaketh. Speaking. That he speaketh expressly. Now, the Holy Ghost can only speak. He can speak with emphasis. He speaketh expressly. What has he got to say? That, in the latter time, Say latter times. You see, he is prophetic in his, in, in his words also. And so the person of the Spirit is talking very emphatically that in the, just before Jesus returns again, latter times, that there will be those who shall depart from the faith. Say depart. depart. And you cannot depart from something you hadn't gotten into. Nobody ever got out of an automobile before they got in. You see, you never left a house until after you went inside. It says, they shall depart from the faith. If you were to ask the people that are in the cults of America today what their upbringing was, you would be, I don't know, you would be so sad for the simple reason that most of them are brought up in evangelical churches. Their parents. I wouldn't want to name the church bodies. There's no need for that. But they were reared up in churches that taught the Bible. And now they have found themselves erring. And have given themselves over to cults. 
the Bible says, the Bible says, that they shall depart from the faith, and then they shall listen to, that means give heed, they shall listen to, they shall accept, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, it's the business of the Holy Ghost that he demand us or warn us of this activity in the last days. And if he takes the time to say don't, you better don't. Poor English and good words. The Holy Spirit speaking emphatically says, expressly he said, that in our times today, some would leave their churches and go to cults, go to spiritism, go to all kinds of evil, morally and spiritually, to accept lying spirits. Now, there are spirits in the world and doctrines that came up out of hell from the devil. I think I'd rather keep to the Bible. The Holy Spirit will help you to keep to... I don't believe the Holy Spirit has ever led anybody astray in the history of mankind. Now, I've talked to a lot of people that have gone astray, and there's some going astray in our country right now that that you know about, you know about. And invariably they read it in another book, not in the Bible book. You'd have done a lot better to study the word. And you know one of the biggest problems with, with, with teachers? They think they gotta tell you something you don't already know. They don't really have to. They can stir up your pure mind, that's what the Bible says, and, and refresh you in what you what you know. But they think they've got to give you something a way out that proves that they're much more clever than you. And if you ever get that feeling, the devil will really get you out there in a bunch of junk and mess that won't save anybody. When I hear of a new doctrine, there's just two or three little things I say. How does it relate to the blood of Jesus? Brother, that's number one. Number two, and this is the big one. How does it relate to saving souls? Yeah. If they don't go out and win souls and save souls, I don't have anything to do with it. The major job, according to the Great Commission, on the face of this earth, is to witness to the whole earth. That's our major job. Our major job is not to build glorious buildings and <laughs> magnificence of men. Our job is to tell the world that Jesus saves. That's our major job on the face of this earth. Okay? Well, that's the beginning of the demands of the Holy Spirit. Let's look into it there with your... With your next point, please. What does the Holy Spirit make demands? It says that the, he demands the Christian how he should walk. And that begins in Galatians uh, 5 and 6. He tells a Christian how to live. We are the body of Christ. Now, now, Christ taught us a lot of things about it, but it says here that the Holy Spirit is identified with it. This I say, walk in the Spirit. Now, how does one walk in the Spirit? The only way that I would know to walk in the Spirit is to walk in prayer and walk in the Word and walk in worship and walk in soul winning. You say, what are you really telling us? I'm really telling you that people that go and, and, and sink themselves in a, in a cloistered place to say, I'm going to go deeper and deeper and deeper. First thing you know, they're so far out of sight, nobody knows where they are. The devil sees to that. The most spiritual thing in the world is to win a soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing more spiritual than that. Because that's the last command that he gave the world. So he says, walk in the Spirit. And he says, if you'll do that, you will not walk in the lust of the flesh. You can't walk both ways. If you're going to walk with God, you're not going to walk with the world. You're fooling yourself when you think you can. When, I, when a person sees me on the street and says, Oh, I, 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 I don't want to see the preacher. Look, look how I look. Well, honey, Jesus saw you. And he's a lot more important. It don't matter who sees you after Jesus sees you. I want to dress for Jesus, not you. If he likes it, you have to take it. I want to talk for Jesus. 
I want to live for Jesus. You can see it, but I'm living for him. Many people don't do that. They say, oh, don't let the preacher know I did this. Oh, what will happen to me if the preacher knows it? Nothing. Jesus already knows it. And he's going to take care of it. And he was afraid you wouldn't understand that verse 16. So he had to give you a second verse here called verse 17. He says, now, you walk according to the Spirit. He's making those demands that you do. And if you'll do that, you won't walk naturally. You won't walk sinfully. Then he says in verse 17, the flesh, which is your Adamic nature? Which is your natural man? Which is your carnality? Which is your sinful thinking and not spiritual thinking? That thing lusteth against the spirit. See the spirit with a capital S still. And that, that just gets me down, you know, that there's something in this world of some demon force that because you're walking sweet and, and holy and lovely before the Lord, it gets mad about it. it. says, I want you over here on my side. Be dirty along with me. That's where sinners are. They want you to join them in their sin. Oh, they'll pay for it the first night, and you'll pay for it for the rest of your life. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, but the spirit fights back against the flesh. Saying, don't, no, don't do that. Don't watch that. Don't, don't say that, you see. So you have a spirit within you that battles back against carnality. Saying, don't do it. Live a Christian life. Live a, you call it conscience, I imagine. It's your Holy Spirit talking to you. So these are contrary one to the other. Well, your life before you were saved, the life you have now, they're contrary to one another. Amen. They are. They fight each other. Amen. And the devil wished you would go back and get drunk again. Amen. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to combat it in the Spirit. And we're going to be winners. Say Winners. winners. Then, then he didn't want you to get discouraged. In verse 18 he says, But now listen, if you are led by the Spirit, that means if you let the Spirit have dominance in your life, that if you let the Spirit uh, coordinate your day, begin it with prayer, with reading the Word, uh, keep some sweet signs around you, and, and witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, and wherever you're supposed to worship, worship there on time. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. I took care of that real quick, didn't it? That you're not under the law. You know, if the law is majorly the Ten Commandments, that's the easiest thing in the world to keep. I just find person after person saying, you know, nobody can keep the Ten Commandments. And I always lean over and say, yeah, uh, which one? And you know those people? They think they got them out of the Sears Roebuck catalog. They don't even know where they are. They, they just heard somebody say that. And then you start explaining it. It says, now the first one is, thou shalt love God. Could you do that? Yeah. Oh, I see. The second one says, don't make images to worship. You don't need to do that, do you? No. Well, I said, you're already victorious over two of them. He says, thou shalt not steal. Can you make that one? Yeah. Thou shalt not commit adultery. How about that one? Yeah. Well, I said, where's the hard one? I don't know. The devil is such a liar. Such a liar. You know. It's wonderful to live for God. Yeah. It says, if you walk in the spirit, you automatically perform the laws, what you do. You just automatically do it. Yeah. When you live right, those Ten Commandments are nothing in the world. You just love them and live them just so beautifully. So if we live in the spirit... Verse 25. Isn't this great? If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Well, you got to, of course. If you're living in the Spirit, you are going to walk in the Spirit. If you're not living in the Spirit, then you're not going to walk in the Spirit. So we are going to live in the Spirit. Can you say amen? amen. Top of page 47 on the demands of the Holy Spirit. Point two says the Holy Spirit demands control of the human mind. You know, I, I accept that. Your mind can flutter worse than anything else. 
Yeah, you hold your feet pretty solid on the earth, but that mind of yours, scatterbrain can go all over the world in a quarter of a minute and be back. And the Holy Spirit wants us to control the mind within us. If you know it, say amen. amen. All right. Philippians 2 and 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Now, if you will have the mind that was in Christ Jesus, you will have a, a spiritual mind. You can walk in holiness with your mind if your mind is the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ because he did. You say, I can't do it. Yeah, you can do it too. The Bible wouldn't be saying, uh, let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus if it wasn't possible. I'd like to go one more than that if it wasn't easy. Are you here now? I am not going to start telling people that it's hard to live for God. It's only hard to live for God if you've got the devil in you. That makes it hard to live for God with the devil in you. Are you here? But if you have Jesus in you, why is it hard to live for God? If the Holy Ghost is in you, why is it hard to live for God? Let's don't go for that. I think God's people are the happiest people in the world. The freest people in the world. The most rejoicing people in the world. And so they don't have to go through all of that melodrama, say, well, if you get saved, you got a long face. Uh, only people of the religion have long faces. Amen. And they're the people that go to church on Sunday and live like the devil the next six days. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 2, 16, for who hath known the mind of Christ that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Sinners don't know the mind of Christ. I don't have the slightest idea about it. They don't have the mind of Christ. But you and I can have the mind of Christ within, within our total being. You say, Brother Sumrall, does Jesus bring demands upon people who, who we might say are not Christians? Well, yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, when I was a, a youngster, I don't know how old, 12, 13 years old, we had a revival meeting in our church. And, and uh, down south, revival meetings were important times. People really came in to them. And a woman came down and gave her heart to the Lord in the altar, knelt and prayed. And her husband was an alcoholic. And he came in the back door and saw it. And he was angry because she was getting saved. I don't think he would have done it if he hadn't been drunk. But he, he came down and picked her up in her middle like a sack of salt. Later through the middle here with the head out one end and feet out the other. And he, he started down the aisle. And, and she wasn't very happy about it. And, and the preacher was a big man. He reached over to say something. And this man said, Reverend, I've been looking for an opportunity to sock you. And so the Reverend stepped back. I was there and saw it. The next day, it rained. I got home from school about 3.30. It rained so hard that the power lines fell right parallel to the church. Now, I live next door to the church, just on the other side. I live there. And I saw these big trucks out there where they were repairing the power line. And, and uh, I went and stood on the eve of the church to look across the street and watch them. This man, Mr. Morris, was one of those men repairing that high voltage wire. He had rubber gloves on. He had rubber boots on. But he was on a slight side of a hill there. And he stepped on a lead pipe and slid, slid with those rubber boots. And he fell on that lead pipe across his back. And on his front was that power line. And he was cooked in a few seconds. The saddest thing maybe I've ever seen in my life was that they tried to revive him for two hours until after dark. And they would yell in his ear, Morris, can you hear me? They'd beat him on the soles of his big boots. Can you feel anything? They did everything possible to bring him back. And he was no further than that back door yonder from where he cursed God the night before and cursed the preacher the night before and walked out of the house with his wife under his arm rather than standing beside him. When you think you can just 
raw hide over the Holy Ghost. You're wrong. To me, well, that whole, did, did you know there are many people that wouldn't stay home that night? They wouldn't stay in their houses. They went to each other's houses to stay with each other. They were so afraid. They didn't know where God's judgment would strike next. And, and, and they said, we don't want to get on it. I think the Holy Spirit makes demands upon sinners just as well as he does upon saints. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? The Holy Spirit has a final word in teaching and administrating. He makes demands that way. You can study that a little further. The Holy Spirit demands that we have, that he have the final word on things like ignorance. Concerning the spiritual gifts, brother, I would not have you to be ignorant. He wants the final word in the say so. For so is the will of God that, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Second Peter 3 and 8, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. The Holy Spirit wants a final word and he, he will have it. Let's give it to him. The Holy Spirit demands that, that he produce fruit in Christian lives. So he said, now the fruit of the Spirit, that's a capital S. The fruit of the Spirit, uh, that it happens to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the, with the affections and lusts. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in that Spirit. Now the first three of these, love, joy, and peace, I reach up to God. You love Him with joy and and peace. The next three, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. You have toward your fellow man. You, have long, you don't need long-suffering toward God. Long-suffering toward your fellow man, gentleness toward your fellow man, goodness toward your fellow man. The final three are within yourself. Faith, meekness, and temperance. We must all have within our hearts. Let us pray.